It's a great joy to be with you today exploring the theology of the Holy Spirit, the meaning of the Spirit for us as the breath of life, the life giver. I'd like to begin by asking a question. When was the Holy Spirit sent to our world? I think many Christians would reply spontaneously at Pentecost. We tend to associate the Holy Spirit with that great story told at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. This is perfectly natural and appropriate. The Pentecostal gift of the Spirit is foundational for everything we are as church. It makes us into the community of Jesus Christ. It commits us to mission, making us witnesses of the good news to the world. Pentecost then is a fundamental part of the story of the Spirit, but the full story is far bigger and wider than Pentecost. We tend to forget the rest of the story of the Spirit. I think we need to rediscover this much larger story of the Holy Spirit. In this first talk then, I will suggest that the full story of the Spirit involves not simply the one episode of Pentecost, but four interconnected sendings of the Spirit. First, in creation. Second, in grace. Third, in the incarnation. And fourth, in the life of the church. And of course, these four episodes are not the whole story either, because the Spirit of God draws us still, always, on into the new, drawing us with all creation, finally, into that great fulfilment of all things in Christ the risen one. So we begin with the first of these, the spirit at work in creation itself. The theological story of the Holy Spirit begins long before Pentecost, long before Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt and away from slavery long before Abraham and Sarah were called to leave their home and go journey into the unknown, long before the emergence of modern human beings in Africa 200,000 years ago, long before the first hominids appeared in Africa. The story of the Spirit's work in our world embraces the whole history of the universe, 13.7 billion years. In the Bible, the English word spirit translates the Hebrew word ruah and the Greek word pneuma. Both these words have the meaning of breath and wind. Behind the biblical idea of the spirit of God, there is the image of God's breath, God breathing life into things. Creatures live, according to the Bible, because God gives them this life-giving breath. In Genesis, God forms the first earthling from the dust of the ground and breathes into the human's nostrils the breath of life. In Job, we find the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. In the great passage of Ezekiel, the breath of God enables dry bones to be brought to life. Psalm 104 sings of all God's creatures, when you send forth your spirit, your breath, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. The images of breath and word are closely interlinked in biblical thought. Creation is attributed to both God's created word and God's life-giving breath. Psalm 36 links the two. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their host by God's breath, the breath of God's mouth. And the same connections made in Judith, let all your creatures serve you because you spoke and they were made. You sent forth your breath and it formed them. The creator spirit is the dynamic, energizing power of God that enables everything in our observable universe to exist and to evolve from
from the very first moment of its existence, from what cosmologists call the Big Bang, 13.7 billion years ago, at least. At the end of his book, A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking asks a famous question. He said, what is it that breathes life into the equations and makes the universe for them to describe? What breathes life? We can explain the universe, but what breathes life into it? And Christian theology does have a response to this. It claims that the creator spirit breathes life, breathes fire, if you like, into the equations. It's the creator spirit who enables a universe of creatures to exist, to evolve and to flourish. In this vision, the spirit empowers the dynamics of the early universe, the emergence of the first stars that lit up the universe 13 billion years ago, the formation of our own solar system around the young sun four and a half billion years ago. The spirit works creatively in and through all these physical processes, delighting in the emergence of complexity and all the processes of self-organization in the pre-life universe. And the same spirit of God breathes life into living things on our planet, into the first forms of microbial life, into multicellular creatures as they emerge, into land animals, plants, hominids, modern humans. The spirit is creatively at work in the whole process, celebrating every emergence, loving life in all its diversity, treasuring its every instance. The second part of this big story of the spirit that I want to discuss is grace. The creator spirit who breathes life into all creation is also the bringer of grace to human beings. I'm using this word grace to refer to God, freely giving God's self in love to human beings. Grace then is God. It is God inviting a human being into interpersonal love. To say yes to this offer of God's is to be embraced by divine love, to be liberated, to be transformed. We say to be saved. The, tr the Christian tradition holds that the grace of the Holy Spirit is given to us in Jesus Christ through his life, death, and his resurrection. We have always associated the free gift of God's grace in the Spirit with Jesus Christ. The Christian community then has struggled to understand what this has meant for people who are not Christian. Very early on, theologians like St. Justin Martyr saw that God was certainly at work and able to save those who were not Christian. But after the last, over the last 2,000 years, there's been a good deal of confusion about this issue. And one of the truly wonderful achievements of the Second Vatican Council was to bring clarity to this issue. The Council teaches that all human beings participate, can participate in salvation in Christ through the grace of the Holy Spirit. We find in a text from the Council these words, for since Christ died for all, and since the final vocation of humankind is in fact one and divine, we ought to believe that the Holy Spirit offers to all, in a way known only to God, the possibility of being associated with this Paschal mystery, the mystery of Christ, his life, death and resurrection. Pope John Paul II very often returned to this teaching, insisting, for example, in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, that this saving work of Christ is truly universal in its scope and that it reaches back to include those who lived before Christ. He says, we need to go back to embrace the whole action of the Holy Spirit, even before Christ, 
from the beginning, throughout the world, and especially in the economy of the Old Testament. There is then a long history of grace, a long history of the work of the Holy Spirit that precedes the historical life of Jesus, going right back to the beginning of human emergence on our planet. When human beings emerged in evolutionary history, they already encountered the Holy Spirit. They emerged into a spirit-filled world. The Creator Spirit is present to each human person as interpersonal love, meeting us in the depths of our personal lives in self-offering. Human existence is always a story of grace in the sense that God is always present offering grace to us in the Holy Spirit. But we humans are free. We can say yes or no to God's self-offering. And alongside the story of grace, there is the willful rejection of grace. Sin that enters into the place of human freedom and inclines us to sin further. Human beings are born into a world of grace, but we're also drawn towards lovelessness, ruthlessness and violence. In the midst of such a world, the Spirit offers freedom and salvation in a way that we Christians see as anticipating and directed towards and springing from Christ. In Jesus, God's saving love reaches its climax in our history and it finds explicit expression. Here God is with us in flesh. In Jesus we see the human face of God. The Spirit of God and the Word made flesh are united together in one divine economy of love. The Word and Spirit are always interrelated. From the beginning, humans have been offered the gift of transforming and sanctifying grace by the Spirit, who is the bearer of the grace of Christ. This means an Aboriginal woman living in this place 40,000 years ago already lived in the presence of the Holy Spirit, already stood before the offer of God's grace. Long before the Gospel of Jesus was first preached here in Australia, this was the land of the Holy Spirit. From creation and grace we move now to the Christ event. We've seen the dazzling work of the Creator Spirit empowering the whole universe. We've spoken of the gracious nearness of the Holy Spirit to us in grace. Now we recall how this same Spirit led the people of Israel throughout their sacred history and brought about the Christ event. The Holy Spirit inspired Abraham and Sarah Moses breathed fire into the prophets, Amos and Hosea, Jeremiah and Isaiah. The same Holy Spirit hovered over Mary, enabling her to be the mother of the Saviour. It is the Holy Spirit who brings about the incarnation. At the beginning of Luke, we find the angel saying to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, the child to be born will be called holy. He will be called son of God. In Matthew, we hear twice that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. The Nicene Creed says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate. Back in the fourth century, St. Ambrose of Milan used a striking expression to express this work of the Spirit in the Incarnation. He said that the Holy Spirit is the author of the Incarnation. The Spirit is the author of creation and the author of the Incarnation. We cannot doubt, he said, that the Spirit is Creator, whom we know as the author of the Lord's Incarnation. One of the truly great theologians of the Holy Spirit is the French Dominican Yves Congar. He insists that in the life of Jesus we find a true history of the Spirit. Jesus is conceived of the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit at his baptism, led by the Spirit in new ways at every point in his life, 
above all, led by the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit in the darkness of his death, the dark night of the cross. And then he is raised up in the power of the Spirit and sends the Spirit upon the disciples. And so Congar notes, if there's a true history of the Spirit in the life of Jesus, we can expect there to be a true history of the Spirit in the life of the church. We need always to be open to the Spirit leading us into the new. So the last of these episodes, if you like, in the big story of the Spirit is Pentecost itself and the Spirit in the life of the church. The Spirit who breathes life into creation, who enfolds human beings in grace, who brings about the incarnation, is poured out upon the community of disciples at Pentecost, constituting them as the church of Jesus Christ, making them a communion of love, sending them an, on mission, witnesses of the risen Christ to the ends of the earth. As Pope John Paul II has said, the Holy Spirit makes the whole church missionary. The Holy Spirit is the principal agent of mission. The missionary church is instituted by the risen Christ and the Holy Spirit. Word and spirit co-institute the church. Word and breath always go together. A long time ago, St Irenaeus talked about the two hands of God, the word of God and the spirit of God. In John's Gospel, Jesus tells Nicodemus, to enter the kingdom we must be born again of the Holy Spirit, that spirit that blows where it will. In his conversation with the Samaritan woman, Jesus speaks of the spirit as a spring of living water welling up from within. And then in his supper discourse, he promises the spirit will guide the church into all truth. The advocate, the spirit of truth, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. In our Catholic tradition, we see the Spirit's guidance expressed in a particular way in the teaching office of the church, in the great councils, in the teaching of the bishops of the church, and particularly the Bishop of Rome. We also see this guiding of the Spirit in all the people of God, in the census fidei of the whole people of God. And we see this guidance of the Spirit expressed in our own personal lives, our own journeys of faith. The Spirit dwells in all of us, makes us into a communion, and gives each member a charism. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Sister Jan Gray is going to speak more about this later on. We need to be open to the Spirit at every point in our life as church. We need to invoke the Spirit in new times and really invoke the Spirit, expect the Spirit to do new things. Of course, we always seek to remain faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the great tradition of the church but we also expect the Spirit to lead us in new ways. We need to discern what the Spirit is asking of us in new contexts, listening to the promptings of the Spirit in the signs of the time, in the light of the Word of God, in the light of Jesus Christ, in the light of our great tradition. The big story of the Spirit then is a story that involves creation, grace, incarnation and the church in mission and it's still far from complete. It will not be completed until all things are taken up and transformed in the spirit by the spirit in the risen Christ. The breath of God always leads us, draws us into the new, into the openness of God's future. The spirit is God before us the Holy Spirit draws us always into the new of God. Thank you.